Hello and welcome to this lesson on measures. It's part of our Functional Skills Maths Level 1 and Level 2 course. We'll be concentrating on the main measures of length, weight and capacity. We cover other measures like money, time and temperature in other videos. So the learning outcomes for this video are to compare, use and convert between units of length, weight and capacity in the same system. The linked learning for this lesson goes back to our multiplying and dividing by 10, 100 and 1000. Many of the conversions we're about to do in our metric system revolve around 10, 100 and 1000. So if you had a number like 3.2 and you had to multiply it by 1000, we showed you the way to do this was to move the decimal point three decimal places and then infill any empty hooks with zeros. So this gives you 3,200. Conversely, if you had a number like 450 and you had to divide it by 1,000, then the process for doing this was your decimal point was here and you moved your decimal point three places to the left. So it became 0.45. And that's a skill that you've already done that is going to help you in this lesson. Let's start with our metric units of measure. These were uh, an international system developed around the time of Napoleon in Europe. And it's based on the decimal numbering system. The beauty of the decimal numbering system means that all of our conversion factors are either 10, 100 or 1000. Our smaller units are tenths, hundredths or thousandths. Let's start with length, which is a measure of distance, something we're quite familiar with. Now, with our measure of length, we need to measure very, very small units. We need medium lengths, standard lengths, and very long lengths. So in our metric system, if we were measuring something like the width of a coin, we would measure it in millimeters, mm. If we were measuring, for example, the length of a book, we would use centimeters. Our standard length, for example, the length of a swimming pool, is the meter. And then finally, our long distance is the kilometer. So we already have heard these terms. What we need to do is to put some numbers to those terms so we understand what they're about. So milli is very small, centi is small, the meter is our standard length, and the kilo is a very long length. So if we put this in a table, it's slightly clearer to understand. Our meter is our standard length. And this is what is in a safe in Paris. And it's a standard length, which is around waist height uh, on the average man or woman. Now, a kilometer is a thousand meters. So the word kilo is a prefix. And kilo means 1000 in Greek. If we look at the smaller units, then we know that centi is one hundredth, like a century or centurion. So that's one hundredth of a metre. And then our very, very small measure is milli, like millipede. So that's one thousandth of a metre. So something used to measure very, very small distances. What we need to remember are the prefixes. These are the key to converting between metric units. Now this system is the most popular with previous functional skills classes where you go from big to small so we've got the kilo as our big unit and the milli at the other end as our small unit and you lay them out in order so you have the kilometer, the standard meter, the centimeter and the millimeter. 
And the golden rule when you're dealing with not just length, but the other units we're gonna come across, is when you go from a big unit to a small unit, so when you're going in this direction, you multiply. And when you're going from a small unit to a big unit, you divide. Now, all you need to remember is what to multiply or divide by. And that's dictated by the prefix. The prefix is the thing that tells you what to multiply or divide by. So all you need to remember is are you going from big to small or small to big and what the prefix means. Kilos a thousand, centis a hundredth and a milli is a thousandth. Some people prefer other systems where you actually remember the conversions that 10 millimetres is a centimetre, there's a thousand millimetres in a metre and so on. But generally, most of my students prefer quickly to scribble this down in exams and then using the prefixes, they know how to do the conversions. And we'll show you that with a few examples now. So, even before you actually attempt a question that has a conversion in it, there's nothing to stop you scribbling down our little reminder on the conversions. So you've got the kilo, you've got the unit itself, which is the meter, you've got the centimeter and the millimeter that's very small. And if I go from big to small, I multiply, and from small to big, I divide. Let me show you how that works. So if I'm converting kilometers into meters, I'm going from big to small. So I take my 1.2 and I'm going to multiply it. Big, a big unit, to a smaller unit. I know a kilometre is a long distance, I know a metre is a round waist height. So what do I multiply it by? Well kilo we know means a thousand. So I multiply it by a thousand to get 1200 metres. Can you see what I did there? Now let's look at the next one. So I'm going from centimetres to metres. Now, because I'm going from centimetres to metres, I'm going from a small unit to a bigger unit. So I need to divide. So I've got my 126 and I'm going to divide it. What do I divide it by? Well, my prefix says centi. So I'm going to divide by 100. So that gives me 1.26 metres. So linking back to our linked learning, multiplying and dividing by a thousand. This is where that linked learning comes in. Next, I've got 1,354 millimetres, so I've got a small unit, and I'm going to convert it into a bigger unit. So I'm going from small to big, I'm going to divide. And the thing I divide by is the prefix, which is a milli, and a milli means a thousand. Remember our millipede and you end up with 1.354 metres. Remember how to divide by a thousand? We did that in a previous lesson in decimals. And finally, if I want to convert kilometres into metres, I've got a big unit that I'm converting into a smaller unit, so I'm going to take the value and I'm going to multiply it. Big to small, multiply. Kilo means a thousand. So I end up with 600 metres. Have a go at these and see how you get on. Don't forget you can scribble down your conversion whenever you have to do this. And just remember big to small multiply and small to big you're going to divide. So I've got a metre and I want to turn it into millimetres. So I'm going from big to small, I'm going to multiply. So I take my number and I multiply it by the prefix, which is a thousand. So 0 0.7 times a thousand is 700 millimetres. Here I've got a metre and I'm converting it into kilometres. So I've got a small unit that's going to be into a big unit, so I need to divide my value and I'm going to divide it by the prefix, 
which is a thousand. So it becomes 0 0.19 of a kilometer. Let's try our next one. I have 1.35 meters and I want it to be centimeters. So I've got a big unit that I'm going to convert into a small unit. So I'm going to multiply that value. Centi means 100. So when I multiply this by 100, I end up with 135 centimeters. Now the only tricky one that you might come across is when you come across one that has two prefixes and all you do is you cancel them out. So the rule is still the same. I've got 56 and I've got a millimeter going to a centimeter. So I've got a small going to a bigger unit. So I'm going to divide. So small to big divide. Now a milli is a thousand and a centi is a hundred. So I can cancel the zeros out. So I need to divide it by 10. An easier way to remember this is because you will have a ruler in the exam, just take a look at your ruler and remember there are 10 millimeters in a centimeter. But this is the prefix way of doing it. So 56 divided by 10 is 5.6 centimeters. So here's a word type question that requires you to do the conversion before you can do the maths. So a kitchen wall is three meters long. Sharon wants to fit as many 60 centimeter units along the wall as possible. How many units can she fit in? So in order to do the maths, we need them both to be in the same units. At the moment, they're different. So I need to convert my three meters into centimeters. So I'm going from a big unit, so if we draw our little sketch, and we're going from big to small, I know that I multiply. So I take my three and I multiply it by the prefix, centi meaning 100. So my wall is actually 300 centimeters long. So 300 divided by 60 gives me five units that I can fit in that space. Here's another one to have a go at. The length of a standard safety barrier on a UK motorway is 30 metres. How many standard safety barriers are needed for a 10 kilometre stretch of motorway? So we need to do a conversion because our two numbers have different units and we need everything to be in the same units. So Let's convert our kilometers into meters so that everything is the same. So let's scribble down our quick guide. So we've got kilo meters, we've got meters, we've got centimeters, and we've got millimeters. So I'm gonna go from a big unit, kilometers to meters, so I'm gonna multiply, and kilo means a thousand. So 10 times a thousand gives me 10,000. So I've got 10,000 meters. So I need to divide 10,000 by 30. Now when I do this on the calculator, I get 333.3. So to answer the question, how many barriers do I need? Well, this is common sense rounding. And in this case, I need to round it up. Because if I round it down, 333 barriers is not enough. So I actually need to round it to 334. Now sometimes it's really useful to do two steps to get from something and this happens when you have very big scales like map scales. So Basically, why do we need to go from centimetres all the way up to kilometres and back? It's because of map scales. And let's have a look with an example. I am using an ordnance survey map with a scale of 1 to 25,000. 
So if we go back to our ratios question, this is the map, this is the real world. The distance from my location to the beach is six centimetres on the map. So the six goes underneath the map side because it's in centimetres. This is in centimetres as well. So when I multiply this by six, I have to multiply this by six. And that gives me 150,000 centimetres for the real world. Now, in the real world, you wouldn't say to somebody, <coughs> the distance from here to the beach is 150,000 centimetres. We would put it into units that people can understand. So, how do I get from 150,000 centimetres to kilometres? Well, I can do it in two steps by going through metres. So, if I'm going from centimetres to metres, so I'm going from small to big, I divide by 100. So this becomes 1,500 metres. And if I'm going from metres to kilometres, I divide by 1,000. I'm going from a small unit to a big unit, so I divide kilo, meaning 1,000. So when I divide this by 1,000, I end up with 1.5 kilometres. That now makes sense. The distance from here to the beach is 1.5 kilometres. Now normally, when you read distances, you're using your ruler. So you have little graduation marks telling you how many centimetres there are. Sometimes you have to work out what these smaller units mean. So, in order to work out the smaller units, just like our sequences, if you have a gap of five and you divide it by five steps, you know that each step is one centimetre. And this is pretty obvious on our rulers. So sometimes they can give you scales that don't have those nice graduations. So for example, if this was 0, 10, 20, 30, and so on, and the arrow was pointing here, how do you work out what the smaller graduations are? So the rule still applies that we use for sequences. I've got a big gap of 10, and I've got 1, 2, 3, 4 steps. So that tells me that each step is 2.5. So my arrow is pointing at seven and a half. So just be aware that when you're measuring things, you don't always end up with a nice neat set of graduations where each one is one. Sometimes you have to work out the smaller graduations, which will be a number other than one. In this example, each step was two and a half. Now, since we're talking about distances, let's introduce you to distance tables. Now, sometimes when you had distance tables in the old days, they used to look like this. And if the car distance from Cardiff to Birmingham was 102, the distance from Birmingham to Cardiff was also 102. So it used to duplicate a lot of information. So what you end up with now are distance tables that kind of save ink. They only give you half of the distances because the other half are identical. In other words, the distance from Berlin to London is the same as the distance from London to Berlin. So there's no point having all that information over here because in printing terms, it's very expensive and it wastes ink. So you need to be familiar with reading these distance tables. So, if we were saying what is the distance from Brussels to Paris, you go down from Brussels and across from Paris. And where the two cross, that is the distance, 261 kilometers in this case. Let's get a quick bit of practice on this. This is from a, an exam where it's asking you to find out the distance from Cardiff to Exeter. So go down from Cardiff, across from Exeter, 
and you add 110 miles. How far is it from Bristol to Hull? Down from Bristol, across from Hull, and you end up with 230 miles. And finally, Desi drove from Bristol to Cardiff and then to Exeter. How far did he travel? So Bristol to Cardiff is 45 miles. And then from Cardiff to Exeter is 110 miles. Add the two together and you end up with 155 miles. And that's our distance tables. Another distance display they seem to like are these network diagrams where they give you locations with distances between them. So if it's 10 miles from Devizes to Uptown, then it's 40 miles from Devizes to Shruton. And the questions go along the lines of pick the quickest route to get from Devizes to Salisbury. So there's a number of ways to do this. You can go straight down this way, you can go down, across and down, or you can go across and then down. So it's asking you to try all of those different routes. So if we go from Devizes to Shruton and then Salisbury, it's 14 plus 11, which is 25. Now, it must be longer if we go that way because we're adding another 14. So logically, we don't have to try that way. Let's have a look at Devizes Uphaven, Amesbury, and then Salisbury. So we end up with 10, then another 9, and then another 8. So that's actually 27 miles. So the shortest distance is Devizes, Shruton, and then Salisbury. Now let's move on to our next measure, which is weight, and that is the mass of an object. So we already have an awareness of some of the metric weights that we use day to day. We know that a milligram is very small, a gram is quite light, a kilogram is how we weigh ourselves, so it's kind of a medium weight, and then there's this very strange one called a ton, and a metric ton is T-O-N-N-E. So let's look at our metric unit system. Our standard unit is the gram. So this is the thing all other things get bigger or smaller from. Now, our word kilo hasn't changed meaning since we used it in length, so it still means a thousand. A milli hasn't changed its meaning either, which means a thousandth. And then finally, our odd one out is the ton. So again, it's a thousand kilograms. So the beauty of converting metric weights is that all of our conversions are the number 1000. So you're either going to multiply by a thousand or you're going to divide by a thousand. And this gives you a sensible answer or a really silly answer. So our quick reference system still works. We have the kilo, our standard unit, which is the gram. Then we have our little unit, which is the milligram. And don't forget this big thing called a ton. If we're going from big to small, we're going to multiply. And if we're going from small to big, we divide. The only number we have to remember on converting weights is the number 1,000. There are no centis or anything else in there for us to think about. Let's see if we can apply some practical knowledge onto the weight of some common objects. So have a look at these objects and try and guess how much each one weighs. Now two really good reference points are the gram and the kilogram. So whenever anybody mentions a gram to me I think of a paperclip. So a paperclip weighs a gram. 
And another metric measure that is a standard for me is that I always remember that a bag of sugar weighs one kilogram. So from this, I can decide how much other things weigh. So for a packet of crisps, I would expect it to weigh 30 grams. It's not going to be in kilograms unless it's an extremely large packet of crisps. A can of beans is kind of half a bag of sugar, so I know that's 415 grams. And then finally, a heavy sack of spuds is two and a half kilograms. It's a couple of bags of sugar. So try and keep some of these reference weights in your mind when you're thinking about your answers. Try and remember a paper clip is a gram and a bag full of sugar is a kilogram. If you want to, you could just remember the conversions between the two, that there's a thousand milligrams to a gram, a thousand grams to a kilogram, and a thousand kilograms to a ton. Or you can remember our little quick guide where we go from big to small, small to big, multiply and divide, and the only number you need is a thousand. So have a go at these and see how you get on. So if you get a conversion of weights in the exam, you can quickly scribble down your reference. Big to small, multiply, small to big, divide, and I'm only ever going to use a thousand as a conversion. So from kilograms to grams, I've got two and a half, that's the number I want to convert. I'm going from a big unit, a heavy unit, to a lighter unit, so I'm going to multiply, and kilo means a thousand. So I end up with 2,500 grams. I've got the gram and I'm going to the milligram. So I've got my number 12. I'm going from a big unit to a smaller unit. So I multiply and the milli means a thousand. So I end up with 12,000 grams. Then I've got milligrams to grams. So I'm going from a small unit to a bigger unit. So I've got the 1354 and I need to divide milli, meaning a thousand. So 1.354 grams. And then finally, I've got kilograms to tons. So I'm going from a small unit to a bigger unit. So the number 8750 needs to be divided. And a thousand is my conversion from kilograms to tons. They're all a thousand. So I end up with 8.75 tonnes. Let's have a look at how this works. So the price of gold is £30 per gram. If a gold bar weighs 1.35 kilograms, how much is it worth? So straight off, your mind is thinking, I've got a relationship and I can see this word per. So it takes us back to our ratio lesson. So we've got a relationship between pounds and grams, and 30 pounds is one gram. I haven't got one gram, I've got 1.35 kilograms. So I've got a conversion to do. So I've got the kilo, I've got the gram, and I've got the milligram. So I'm going to go from big to small, so I multiply, and my conversion kilo is a thousand. So if I multiply that by a thousand, I get 1,350 grams. So the 1,350 grams lives on this side of my ratio. I've gone from 1 to 1,350, so I know I've multiplied it by 1,350. And what I do to one side, I do it to the other. So 30 times 1,350 is 40,500 pounds. So the answer is it is worth £40,500. Let's have a look at another quick example. A curcodamol tablet contains 120 milligrams of codeine. If the safe dosage of codeine is 0.8 of a gram per day, what is the maximum number of curcodamol tablets that you can have? So I need to find out how many times 120 milligrams goes into 
0.8 of a gram, but we've got different units. So I need to convert one or the other so that they're the same. So if I jot down my quick aid memoir, and I'm going from, let's say, grams to milligrams, so I'm going from big to small, I multiply, milli meaning a thousand. So I'm going to multiply this by a thousand, which we did in our decimals lesson. So you end up with 800 grams. So I've got 800 grams as my limit, and I divide it by 120. I get 6.6 .6 recurring. Now, this is where common sense kicks in again. If I round this up to seven, I'm gonna overdose on cocodamol. Therefore, I need to understand that I have to round down. So six tablets would be the maximum, because if you go to seven tablets, you're gonna to take too much cocodamol. Again, with weight, it's exactly the same scale system that you use for length. That you have to look at your big scale and work out the distance, and then count the number of small steps to work out what each of these small steps are worth. So if I've got one and I divide it by one, two, three, four, then each small step is worth a quarter. So where is my arrow pointing? Well, it's two whole and one, two, three quarters. So it's two and three quarters of a kilogram. Let's look at our next measure, which is capacity. And this is the amount of fluid a container can hold. We come across different units in the metric system. So we have very small units, which are milliliters. We sometimes come across centiliters in cans of Diet Coke and so on. And then our biggest unit is actually our base unit, which is the liter. Now, this makes conversion really, really easy. So with our capacity, we only have two prefixes, centi and milli. So our base unit is the liter, and then we're either going to divide by 100 or multiply by 100 or divide or multiply by a thousand. So for our system, our base unit is the litre, then we have the centiliter and the milliliter, big to small, multiply, small to big, divide. If you want to, you can remember the conversions themselves. So there's a thousand milliliters in a litre, 100 centiliters in a litre, and 10 milliliters in one centiliter. So let's put this into practice with a few examples. So all you need to remember is your conversion. Your base unit is the litre, then we have the centiliter and the milliliter, and if I'm going from big to small, I multiply, and small to big, I divide. So I've got 1.3 of something, which is litres, and I want them into centiliters. So I've got a big unit going to a small unit, so I'm going to multiply centi, meaning 100. I've got centiliters and I want to convert it into liters. So I've got a small unit that's going into a big unit. So my value is 168. I need to divide it centi by 100. Remember how to do this in our decimals questions. And then the next one, I have milliliters and I want to convert them into liters. So I've got a small unit going into a big unit, so I divide. Milli tells me to divide by a thousand. Remember how to do this? And then finally, I've got 0.45 of a liter and I want to convert it into milliliters. So I've got 0.45 as my value. I've got a big unit being converted into a little unit, so I'm gonna multiply milli meaning a thousand.
Let's put this into practice then. So the capacity of a magnum of champagne is 1.5 litres. If one glass of champagne can hold 120 millilitres, how many glasses can I fill from the bottle? So we've got an issue here. We've got two different types of units. So to work this out, we need to put them into the same units. So let's convert our 1.5 litres into millilitres. So I'm going from a big unit to a small unit. So I need to multiply milli by a thousand. So I get 1,500 millilitres as the volume of a magnum champagne. So all I need to do now is take my 1,500 and divide it by 120. And you end up with 12.5 glasses. So applying our common sense, how many glasses can I fill from the bottle? We round it down to 12 glasses. And tell the examiner that you're rounding. Here's another one then. A can of Coke can hold 33 centilitres. If our Anne buys 35 cans, how many litres of Coke can Anne have? So we've got the 33 centilitres and we're going to multiply it by the 35 cans. Your answer is going to be in centilitres, so then we can do the conversion afterwards. So we have 1,155 centilitres that we need to convert into litres. So we're going from a small unit to a big unit. We divide centi by 100. So we end up with 11.55 litres. Just like length and weight, you could be given a scale to read. Again, the golden rule never changes. Count the big units and divide it by the number of steps. So to get from 150 to 200, I have a gap of 50 millilitres. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 steps. So each step is 10 millilitres. So my reading is... 170 millilitres. And this giving you a diagram to read, whether it's length, weight or capacity, is quite common in level one. So in conclusion, doing metric units and switching between them is essentially a question of remembering the three base units of metres, grams and litres, and then understanding what the prefixes mean. Kilo is a thousand, centi is a hundred, milli is a thousand. And if you keep that in mind, even before you get to a conversion question, when the exam starts, you can write down your little guide that says, if you're going from big to small, you multiply, and if you're going from small to big, you divide. And all you need to multiply or divide by is the amount the prefix represents. Kilos a thousand, centi a hundred, milli a thousand. Now we also need to have an understanding of imperial units. And in class, we do an exercise on the imperial units that are out there. Now we come out with words like yards, miles, gallons, stones, ounces, pints and so on. Now the issue with imperial units is that it's not a system that's really easy with tens, hundreds and thousands. For example, there are 12 inches in one foot or there are eight pints in one gallon. So the conversion is very, very difficult because they're all over the place. Now you're not expected to know the imperial unit conversions except for that one foot is made up of 12 inches. That's the only one you need to commit to memory and that they might not give you in an exam. 
All of the others, three feet is one yard, 16 ounces is a pound and so on, will be given to you if you need them in the exam. And if they do give them to you, all you need to do is create the strap line and do the conversion of whatever it is they haven't given you. So it's a parts ratio. If you have to convert imperial to metric units, then they must give you the conversions between these. And again, that's the strap line. So if they tell you one inch is 2.5 centimetres, use that as a strap line. And then if they give you inches, stick it under the inches side of your ratio to find out your centimetres. If they give you centimetres, stick it under the centimetres side of your strap line and then work out what your inches are. So all of these conversions are essentially given to you and are strap lines for you to do that conversion. That's why parts ratios are really, really important. Let's have a look at a couple of examples from our CGP book. So they start off by giving you the strap line. One kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So remember on our ratio, how to set up a strap line. And then whatever they give you, you stick under the relevant side. So here they're giving us four kilograms. This is the kilogram side of my ratio. So it's a parts ratio. How did I get from one to four? I multiplied it by four. I do the same on the other side and I end up with 8.8 .8 pounds. Can you see how I got that? It's the same for any of these. So if you're ever given a conversion, it's the strap line to a parts ratio and where they're going to give you the one of the two parts. Here they're giving us 42 grams. Now, don't forget how to work out the scale if you've got difficult numbers. All you do is you divide 42 by 28 and it will tell you what this scale is. So here our scale is one and a half. So what you do to one side, you do to the other. So you end up with 1.5 ounces. Sometimes at level two, you're required to do two conversions within the one question. And it could go like this. Jessica is five feet four inches tall. What is her height in meters? And they've given us this strap line where we've got a relationship between meters and inches, and it's one meter is 39 inches. Now, her height is in feet and inches, so we need to convert it all into inches so we can use our strap line. Now the one thing I told you to remember is that one foot is 12 inches. So five feet is 60 inches. Plus the four we've already got means that Jessica's height in inches is 64 inches. Put the 64 on this side of your formula and work on this side of your strap line and then work out the scale. 64 divided by 39 will tell me what my scale is. And you end up with quite a large number. So in this instance, let's round it to two decimal places, 1.64. Multiply the other side by 1.64 and you end up with 1.64 meters as her height. Now the reason we didn't cover money, temperature and time in this lesson on measures is that we've done them all before this lesson. So just as a quick reminder and recap, here are three questions to have a go at on money, temperature and time. So for the first one, it costs Helen £2.60 for a dozen cupcakes. How much is it for one cupcake? So I've got £2.60 and I need to divide it by 12. 
and you end up with 0.216 recurring on your calculator. Now because this is pence, so this is originally pounds, and we know this is 21.6 recurring pence, this recurring means you can round it up to 22 pence per cupcake. If the temperature in Moscow is minus 6, so let's look at our temperatures, and London is 5 degrees C, what is the temperature difference? I have a gap of 6 here and a gap of 5 there. So the 6 plus the 5 tells me there's 11 degrees C difference. And finally, on time. Rick makes 20 sprockets in 45 minutes. How long does it take him to make one sprocket? So we need to divide the 45 minutes by 20 to work out what one sprocket is worth. So we end up with 2.25 minutes. Now it wants the answer in minutes and seconds. So back to our lesson on time. I know two minutes is two minutes. And if I have decimal time, to come out of decimal time and turn it into seconds, I multiply it by 60, which is 15 seconds. Did you get these questions correct? If you're a bit rusty on money, temperature or time, please go back and re-watch those videos. There are several other conversions of units that we need to look at. One of them is converting money as either a ratio or on a graph. So we've already done this in ratios. If, for example, one pound was $1.25 and I'm going on holiday and I take 200 pounds with me and I convert it into dollars, what is it worth? Well, this is a strap line and I've been given a parts ratio where I've been given the pounds. Because I'm going from 1 to 200, my scale is 200, so if I multiply this side by 200, I end up with $250. So another way to do conversions is if you're given a graph. And it is really as straightforward as plotting the value that you know and then working out the value you don't know. So in this example, let's see how much 40 British pounds is in Australian dollars. So our graph shows British pounds against Australian dollars. And I want to find out what 40 pounds is worth. So I've got 40 pounds. What's that equal to? Now, the way to do it is draw a line up from the value you've got and hit your conversion line. That's what this straight line is. Read it across on the other axis and you come out here. Now, remember what we said about scales. I know what the big gap is, which is 20. And I know there are one, two, three, four, five steps for each of these small units. So each small step is worth four. So my arrow is pointing at one, two, three, four lots of four, which is 16. So it's 80 plus the 16, which is my small units, which means I get 96 Australian dollars for my 40 pounds. And this works the other way around as well. If I wanted to convert 120 Australian dollars, I draw the line across until it hits the line, and then I draw the line down, and I can work out that it's worth 50 British pounds. And that's how you use conversion graphs. If you're converting temperature, generally you will be given a formula to convert temperature. So to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius, it's 9 fifths C plus 32. Let's just say I wanted to convert 10 degrees C into Fahrenheit. Let's look at the Pete's process for doing this. Well, we first of all put it out in longhand. So it's 9 fifths of 10 plus 32. Bid mass tells us to do 9 fifths of 10 first. So 9 fifths of 10, 
Remember our manual methods, that's what we do first. Gives us 18. So I've got 18 plus 32, which gives us 50 degrees F. So my 10 degrees C is 50 degrees F. Just like money conversion graphs, you can get temperature conversion graphs. And the process is exactly the same. If you want to convert Celsius or Fahrenheit, you look up the value that you've got, and then you go across and take your reading for the other value. Let's just say I want to convert 25 degrees C into degrees F. So you get 25 and you draw your straight line using a ruler and then wherever it hits your conversion graph, draw a line down and you get 75 degrees F. And that's how you convert using a conversion graph. And that completes our learning outcome. To compare, use and convert between units of length, weight and capacity in the same system. But we also took the opportunity to have a recap on money, temperature and time and we introduced you to conversion graphs. The real important things to remember from this part of the lesson, we have basic metric units for length, for capacity and for weight. So they are your basic metric units. And if you can remember what the prefixes are that go with those, that will do your conversion for you. So kilo is a thousand, centi a hundred, and milli a thousand. And that completes this video on measures. If you want more information or more practice on any of the topics covered, then please see your teacher. I hope you've enjoyed this video.